All right. I'm not, I'm not sure how to stop this now. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I think I'm talking to myself right now, if someone's there. <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> okay. Okay, good evening everybody. Thank you for waiting and welcome to Butcher Boulevard show, Decolonization, Not Just a Buzzword. We're very excited to have it here for the SOAS Festival of Ideas. This show has been made in residence at SOAS through interviews and conversations with the SOAS community, looking at the whole subject around the decolonization of the curriculum debates that the university has had. I'm going to pass you over to Neela, one of my colleagues and collaborating artists, who will tell you a bit about how we've put together this Zoom performance. Thank you, Neela. Neela, are you there? Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Thank you for bearing with us as we had a few technical hiccups. I'm glad that you're all now in the space. Thank you for joining us. So the show that you are about to see is a recording that we made on Zoom of the play, um, Decolonization, Not Just a Buzzword. So it's a pre-recorded film, but it was filmed on Zoom. So it will look like a live show to you, hopefully. Um, massive shout out to our actors, some of whom are, are here today watching as well. So Tunji, Bartel, Sophie, Anna Maria, Josephine, Anna and Rajivan. Thank you so much for being a part of this show for us when we recorded it. We are gonna attempt to stream the video to all of you now through Zoom. Um, but in the chat box, I'm also going to post the Vimeo link with a password in case the streaming doesn't work for you and you prefer to watch it on Vimeo. The show is about 58 minutes long, so we were planning to come back for the panel at 6pm, but I think we'll have to come back at 6.15 or 6.20. Someone, does that sound good to you? Yeah, yeah. But before we begin, I just also wanted to add, we have two other people from our creative team, Sudha Butcher and Christine Landon-Smith, who directed the show, and our wonderful panellists who comprise five people who work in arts and cultural and education scenes. I'm going to mention their names. Jawad Alipur, Kwame Boateng, Iqbal Khan, Gemma Desai and Miriam Francois. It's fantastic panel and it will be a great question and answer and sharing session. So enjoy the film, but please don't bunk off because we really would like you to share in the conversation afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Hello. Hiya. Hey. 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 Good to everyone? see you. Bad, thanks. Good. 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 Everyone here? <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so, hi. Uh, we've got these headphones and we're about to do a headphone verbatim show over Zoom. Uh, we hope with no internet dropouts. <laughs> The show is called Decolonization, Not Just a Buzzword. In our headphones, we're listening to people's voices, their edited interviews. We've never met them or seen them. We just repeat exactly what we hear with all the nuance of it and not adding any kind of judgment onto it. So the person that we're hearing and sharing with you might not have the same age, gender or ethnicity as us. We're just simply trying to find them through the sound. No judgment, just say it as we hear it. Thank you for watching. Everyone ready? Mm -hmm. Three, two, one, play. I chose SOAS because I think it's one of the universities where you can do African studies. It's just not so Eurocentric based. I think I always had an interest in history, but it always, I felt like I could never relate to it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fun. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm a bit disappointed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I like it, don't get me wrong. It's like, I just didn't necessarily expect this. I do really enjoy my course, but, but my culture in Africa course, we don't really, we just focus on Sub-Saharan Africa because North Africa is seen as part of the Middle East, which doesn't really make sense to me since it is in Africa. Not what I expected, to be honest. And the name is problematic. Yeah. We that a lot, the Oriental. I don't really understand how you're talking about decolonizing the university and the curriculum, but then yet yeah, your name is racist. It's problematic, but I think they should keep that. Whoa, why? You change your tune. We erase names, we erase history. I guess. East Asians or, or yeah. people of Asian descent would feel, we know it's offensive, but it's not personal. Yeah. It's not like directly offensive towards us. That's not really our discussion to lead. SOAS was originally founded to uh, train colonials and servants. Um, I frequently bring up in class with my students a speech that Lord Curzon makes shortly before the school is founded in 1916. He's talking to uh, a group of, I think, bankers. It's, it's very clear, he says, you know, we need an institution like this to provide training to colonial civil servants. Um, and I think there's even a throwaway comment about how if he had spoken the languages of the East, that would have been quite useful when he was on his famine tours, presumably in India. Famine tours, yeah. And Said also says in an interview, one of his throwaway explanations for what Orientalism is, he says, to rule them, you have to know them. And I think there's a very nice pity formulation that describes the relationship between knowledge and power. I have a sort of lingering doubt every so often about how much has changed, to what extent are our objectives today really that different. We may call it development, we may call it humanitarianism, but um, those old ways of thinking uh, persist and have afterlives and uh, I think it would be complacent of us to assume that because we have this radical left-wing reputation we don't need to decolonize. The longer you spend here you do realize that every generation we advance the work of the last generation in some ways I have colleagues here who say they've been decolonizing the curriculum since 1947 so sometimes when I speak to older colleagues, they smile at the idea that now with the university needs to be decolonized. But I think that what decolonization means is changed in a nutshell. It means to be more aware of who I am and who I'm talking to, to take that subject position seriously. I also see it as connected to a public conversation in Britain about who we are, about what we're about. Now, what I teach is recognizable to what I taught 10 years ago. I mean, we can see in the public debate all the time, this increasingly contested ideas of what the legacy of empire is about and who it benefited and what we should take from it. Increasingly, a lot of the reading is about devaluing or questioning of university metropolitan production knowledge.
and then it comes much harder to teach students because what are we going to teach and that's where i think i struggle a little bit i mean to think about britain as a nation state when for all of its last kind of three four hundred kind of years it's actually been a big imperial federation incorporated lots of different people we can talk about the core production of knowledge that's okay but I do that from SOAS in the middle of Bloomsbury. So is it really okay? You can reframe the problem of decolonization as being one about democratization. And so what we're trying to do is just have a more equal world where that requires us to unpick this thing. So one of my interests is really to try and broaden out the conversation, to think about how this conversation places us within a wider world encouraging conversations out in the corridors, encouraging conversations between constituencies who don't speak to another, I because they don't have access or because they don't want to speak to one another or they don't know they can speak to one another. It's a Pandora's box in the sense that once you start to pull at the threads, just how systematic the issues are, these things are like drilled into us from year zero, all of us and so in my anthropological practice, I like to think about constructions and arguments. So in thinking about how a boat is made or thinking about how you rebuild a city after an earthquake. And one of the things that power allows you to do is just ignore good arguments. I suppose what I see in the decolonization debate is a series of abstract committed ideas that don't have any concrete vision. There's no boat at the end of it. What in those abstract ideas are we working towards building? And I suppose I don't know the answer. So in my journey to SOAS, it's not really a straight line. I come to a poetry night here when I was about 17 and thought, oh, SOAS could be cool, but I'm gonna be a dancer, I'm not gonna to go to SOAS. So I'm born and bred in London. My parents are from Nigeria. I was from a former French colony and I didn't even know that until I was about 16. I feel very connected to my Nigerian heritage. So I came to a to a poetry night called Decolonising Our Minds and was like, wow, what is this? I feel connected to the idea, to being that child of Africa and being someone who comes from somewhere and a branch of a tree where there is a root. Yeah. Um, basically learned about my family's history and started a dialogue with my dad about that and difficulties I was facing a dance training made more sense as well. Well, it's an acronym, but it's um, used as a word today. Huh? In terms of being able to articulate things as racism rather than just me being a bad dancer or a bad student or didn't have the right body. Um, no, maybe it's on purpose that it's used as an acronym in that we are the University of London trying to avoid to have that very long name which could be a bit embarrassing or... No one in the faculty was a person of colour, so when I had agreements with a choreographer I was told that I made things too personal, I made everything about me. It's a bit surprising, that history of this particular school. But then when I came to SOAS, there was a teacher who was talking about colonial relationships. She was really passionate, so she said, oh, for example, if I was the colonizer and you were the colonized, and she pointed at me. Because we all know that SOAS is very anti-imperialist, as we know today, that between the same walls, classroom, uh, lecture hall, some people used to learn how to apply um, domination of other cultures, how to extract wealth, uh, for uh, metropole interests. And um, I don't take it personally at all, but later in the day she emailed me to a massive email to say that what she did was really inappropriate and she couldn't stop thinking about it. If I wanted to take it to management, she felt happy to do that. Uh, but that, yeah, uh, 100 years later, it's a totally different history we hear. It has changed here. I was completely shocked from having come from that situation where I was told that the M-word was being taken too personally. I studied the Industrial Revolution in detail history and like nothing was ever mentioned about where the money came from or where the labour came uh, from. In high school, in Belgium, it was mostly in history classes that we were supposed to learn about history of Belgium and part of it, Congo. We got that aspect, but quite late. You know, when we had like Remembrance Day in school, we never came 
talked about where the body came And from. I think I was in a very open-minded school. I've heard it wasn't the case everywhere in Belgium. Some school teachers nearly speak about it. Um, so coming to SOAS, I was like, oh, not only do I need to decolonize, I almost need to learn the history of colonization first. Born in Kent, and since a young age, my parents were running their own business. So they were, um, first of all, doing a fish and chip shop, and later we had um, a Chinese takeaway in Beckenham. And I went to a grammar school in North London as well, so like incredibly privileged education, and it was predominantly South, South Asian students as well. So I find it actually quite interesting that none of us ourselves were having that conversation either. Dad's like in the back, he's cooking, my mum's front facing, you know, with the customers. And we also were there, like, helping my mum, helping my dad. It's weird to have this small shop in mostly white neighbourhoods, quite working class neighbourhoods, where our parents are sort of making Chinese food, but it's also not their original vocation. It was actually quite sad. And, like, I remember my dad tried to engage me in, like, Indian history a lot when I was younger, and I kind of just rejected it. I was like, I found this thing that I'm really interested in, i.e. British history or English history. And then I now, like, looking back, realised that it was just him trying to fill in the gaps for me, being like, you have such a rich history. You're, like, the cradle of civilization, and you're out here caring about, like, whatever, Anne Boleyn. <laughs> and that was kind of where I realised I needed to decolonise. Um, a lot of the time we get, like, you know, like, school children who might be, you know, a bit cruel or abusive or you know you get like fake callers or you get people who definitely around race that was the primary thing and so some of it is sort of really literal like sort of you know oh, slit eyes and that kind of stuff and like oh let's just call them up and it's fun to just mess around something as basic as linking contemporary racism to like slavery or to colonialism in general was something that i was not able to do before i came to SOAS. So, I, you know, I grew up with a lot of this kind of people coming in and out. Uh, you know, my father, who's just very working in the kitchen. We don't get much from him in the, the way of like proper, proper like discussion, talk. We never got that until um, we sold the shop. But often he would crack, you know, the pressure would be a lot and no one should take all that. If I talk to my friends who aren't doing the same studies as me, I can seem a bit ridiculous to them sometimes, I think, if I'm talking about something that happened half a millennium ago. People are like, are you sure that that relates to what's going on today? But for me, it means, I think, I'm doing a lot of internalised racism that I had, of like thinking of the countries of which I'm from, Sudan and India, being like third world countries or backward countries or dirty, smelly, like all of these ideas that we had and understanding how we got there and where these ideas have come from. And I kind of grew up not really liking the colour of my skin and things like that. I did English literature first and then I did human rights law at St Andrews in Scotland. I think it reflected my own kind of model minority ambitions. Uh, my own elitist ambitions, which still persist, definitely. And I remember coming to SOAS and literally being a bit ashamed and embarrassed that I hadn't had these thoughts for myself already, that I hadn't begun to engage or like decolonize myself. And that was when I was like, you have to take some responsibility for your learning now. It's kind of up to you now to like, to like take it away. If, if you type in like anything related to model minority or independent, or these are stereotypes that have also been studied on a sociological level, that idea of kind of the Chinese person as kind of being perceived and then also internalizing themselves as being very capable of handling things on their own. They resolve things, they stand alone. Uh, the Chinese would kind of seek to rise above other ethnic minorities and become closer to the white. So those has rituals and traditions that are almost comical, you know, where everyone walks around or the copy of Edward Said's Orientalism and it gets turned into this Bible and no one's actually read it. So I came to SOAS and I felt, okay, this is going to be the place that I'm able to look at non-European thinkers where I'm able to and encouraged to think critically. And you know, this performance of decolonism that doesn't actually go into the structure of it, I think. But when I came here, I was quite shocked at just how insidious white epistemologies and colonialism and white supremacy are, because even when you are here, you're learning about people from the eyes of the Europeans. At the end of the day, anthropology, the, the subject in itself, the field in itself, is literally the, 
it's it's literally the child of the eugenics it's the child of wanting to go out and measure skulls wanting to set apart certain human beings from others i mean i think the name so as in and of itself could be our version of the statue you know school of oriental and african studies Plato, I think, provides a really good example of decolonizing the mind with this allegory of the cave, where people are in a cave underground and they're in shackles and their heads are even shackled to face a wall. And from behind them, there's a fire and it illuminates things going by. And the, that's then projected onto the wall. And they see these shadows of animals and people walking by and they think that these shadows are the real world. And this is what reality and knowledge is. And one day, one man escapes. It's a painful uh, sent to, to get out of the cave and into the sunlight. And then he realizes that there's a whole other reality. Uh, he goes back down, and the question is, uh, will the others believe him? Uh, they probably wouldn't believe him and might even do away with him. He leaves it open. Plato leaves it open. Coloniality of linguistic research. I think for me that is a very important agenda and it starts for instance with the research paradigms that normally there is one researcher who <laughs> comes from the global north who does research on an endangered language <clears throat> so it's the usual data extraction model and because the funding models of course give all the power to the researchers from the global north another issue is of course that language documentation has kind of global claims to preserve human knowledge for humanity. But if you look at our archives, they're all located in the global north. And in order to access these data, one needs a very fast internet connection, a huge data allowance. So while we pretend that this is for humanity, it is actually for the benefit of a very privileged group. You come to Sarah's and you're like, yeah, you know, you study non-European history. What more is there to decolonize? And then you start to realize, actually, it's not enough to just have on your curriculum. Yep, we're studying South Asian, Middle East. That means we've decolonized. Not at all, because you realize that history is mostly about who's written it rather than what's being taught. So this is a project that I started working on. I guess in the late summer of this year and it grows out of a course that I teach on the history on histories of partition. There are a number of South Asian women students who got quite upset by the course very understandably and who have family connections to 1947 and I mean one of the things they were sort of saying is that they've been told about 1947 within their families and then this course is coming along and giving them a totally different narrative. Colonization I think is um, like a very structural change so for me I understand it as giving people a voice and let them write their own stories um, I think the best example of that is partition history mostly focuses on oral history it's brought out a whole side of South Asian politics that you never even really realized before and they enjoyed the course and they were interested in it but they found it profoundly disturbing and upsetting and the course itself is about history and the politics of memory and who gets to, me to remember and how things are remembered so lots of their reactions were totally central to the theme of the course but i also obviously didn't want to sort of say now then cast let us take these students as specimen but i began to really think about this politics of emotion that rather than saying why do these students feel emotionally upset by this course i wanted to ask why can white british students sit in this course and feel complete detachment why is emotion that whole, um... inside understanding of community and hiding their trauma and why they hit it and how affected the whole subcontinent is by that emotionally. I come from a colonial family. My grandfather was a missionary in South India and my dad was born in 47. It's a classic case of these kind of children of the Raj. He, he hated Edinburgh and wanted to get back to the kind of jungles of South India and he has this 
incredible nostalgia. I know that there have been moments where I've stood in the classroom and I've talked about we, and by we, I mean white settlers in India or white colonists in India. And I do this not because, because I have this you know, feeling that that's my team, but that's, but that's ingrained in me through, through the education I've had, through a lot of guilt I carry through this relationship with my own family. So actually that use of we is not straightforward, but how it can be heard by students is fantastically divisive and fantastically important. There is going to be a power hierarchy. You can't overcome that. You know, you're a white Westerner, you're, you, sorry, right, white researcher who comes from a, usually from a Western institution, you know, even if you're not Westerner, you're from another society, you're associated with a Western institution and you go into these communities, it, it has all sorts of, you know, colonial connotation. And I started as a researcher in Sub-Saharan Africa, and my focus was on the gender dynamics of agricultural systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. So looking at that literature, I was asking, where are the voices of the people? Because, because these theorizations have been primarily attuned to Western feminists' understanding of gender relations. So there, it is not fair for anyone to be imposing their normative standards on anyone else. You know, every person you talk to will have a different understanding of decolonization. But for me, it really means to not transpose normatives on other people. That means, means to uh, decolonize your thinking, your analytical gaze, but also be a little humbler with your conclusion. I mean, in my research, I don't speak in terms of funding, findings. I, I don't believe in finding. I believe in insight. I don't think we should look at the skin color of scholars. We should look at the quality of scholarship and the objectivity of scholarship. Now, that's not to say that I, am, I do not see that uh, for a lot of subjects, the bulk of scholarships are produced by your uh, middle-aged white male. Now, that's a historical legacy, and we don't want that to continue for the sake of it. But what we don't want is to make your middle-aged white male scholars feel as they are illegitimate in what they do. So making sure that other voices are being heard, other perspectives are being heard, does not mean that we restrict perspectives from any particular one. I spent years living in traditional communities of yogis in India. Well, I did Sanskrit as an undergrad at Oxford, and I went off to India on a gap year. Well, sort of a fake sadhu, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I look at the part. Well, I suppose my position is about as colonial as it gets. The study of Sanskrit is sometimes associated with some of the worst aspects of uh, colonialism. Even now, you know, if sometimes in India, if I go to a library, trying to get manuscripts, that this sort of idea that I'm coming to steal the knowledge, it's sometimes framed as the West is still trying to colonize India for its knowledge. And I've been on a sort of a panel of a literary festival in Jaipur, yeah, on cultural appropriation, where I and a colleague were kind of set up as the, you know, the white guys who come and study yoga, you know, translate it, and put their own spin on it, which was completely unfair, I thought. One of the people on the panel was trying to sort of frame us as neo-colonialists. You know, they were sort of saying, why should you be doing it? Why should an Indian be doing what you're doing? Well, I said they could, but they don't. You know, I spent years rummaging around in libraries looking for old manuscripts that hasn't been looked at for hundreds of years. So that was my sort of one way of trying to justify what I do. 50 years ago, there were lots and lots of Indian scholars who produced fantastic work and really good critical historical scholarships. Unfortunately, that's getting, you know, their, their number is getting fewer and fewer. There's an argument that that in itself is a result of colonialism in that we kind of decimated the Indian uh, educational system. But in terms of uh, cultural appropriation, well, yeah, I just think it's uh, a not helpful term at all. You know, all history is a study of cultural appropriation, basically. Well, you know, as soon as I say anything like that, well, actually, I'm going to be held up for having dreadlocks. You know, like Justin Bieber, he got flagged, didn't he, when he had dreadlocks put in. 
when we had a culture in Africa class, uh, first class, it's okay for you to want to learn more about African culture as a white person, but to say that the reason that you're taking culture in Africa is because you want to help the poverty in Africa and not even be specific about what help, what poverty you want to address. There are so many people like that in my class. And I was like, yo, like, what's good? What are you doing here? No, you're not. They have this whole like monolithic idea of how Africa is one place. Mm. A lot of us are here just trying to find who we are. We're just trying to find our ancestry. We're trying to find where we come from. You know, what, what, what's the flag that we carry every time in our house? What does that mean? And for them, it's like, you know, let me just, you know, discover stuff. Let me just learn stuff. The whole problem is once you decolonize, what do you replace the power structures that were there? What do you replace them with? We're looking at it in terms of pulling down a power structure that is represented by the white male supremacist, if you like. I don't think we have actually rethought the structures. I think we democratize and we want to open and expand the space and bring in more voices. And that's where it will come from. People feel as though as if they immerse themselves in a culture in a year, two years, three years, five years, 20 years, that they know more than people who actually are part of those cultures. When I think about it, it's unbelievable that I didn't know it was from a former colony until quite recently in my life. And I would like for there to be more respect and more opportunity for people with diasporic identities writing about themselves. Like my dad is someone who was uh, displaced from the Ivory Coast. I don't know if anyone ever questions if the people that we write about even know that, have even read what has been written about them. Do they even have access to that? I never really had the sympathy that I have for my dad now. And we have like a little, a little relationship building, going on through decolonizing, which is quite funny, but really lovely because I never felt I had that much in common with my dad, but my ISB, so my independent study project is going to be about beauty standards for black British women. I'm really grateful that I had access to a situation which helped me to be able to see that. Otherwise, I think I would have just gone my whole life not thinking about it. And it's going to be talking about nails and hair within a British context, things that I know that will be interesting for people like myself to read rather than reading about, you know, like rituals and witch doctors, because that is actually what is written about people of African descent, which is not what I see when I go home. <laughs> My dad just spoke French and that was it. It wasn't something to be questioned. It didn't occur to me that they, they speak French because they're French and we speak French because we were colonised. I think white people have to be ready to accept that colonisation happened, that their ancestors probably had a hand in it. Statues, even two days ago, I was at a friend's birthday dinner and I had the conversation about statues again even people who say they're not racist and they're anti-racist and I tell them well why don't we take down the statues they get so angry and defensive and it's a very emotional reaction if you can let go of your white guilt and your white privilege and engage with people of color on how they feel about colonization and how colonization affects them to this day there's no need for it to affect harmony and peace and conversation. It's so implicated within the British culture. I think this, this glorification of empire tends to be more of a white people identity that ties into a narrative of who counts as being British. If white people are going to use it as an excuse and they're like, oh, it makes me uncomfortable, I don't care because I'm made to feel that way every day by the structures in which we live. I need you to leave that at the door so we can have a conducive conversation here. I find this statue so incredibly fascinating coming from a German perspective where we would not have statues of Hitler. Then why do people when I talk to them say, but not everything about the empire is bad, so we just glorify everyone. And um, because you, I don't think white people have a say on how colonization makes you feel. Like, as a, that's my space. White people have space everywhere. Germany has not confronted colo its colonial past. I mean, we're far from it, but we confronted our um, legacy of the Holocaust. The British have not done that at all, and it has incredible implications on the climate today. So, actually, if I'm going to take up more space at university, I think I have every right to. In Germany, we don't actually have anthropology, per se, because it's too tied to narratives of social Taoism and Nazism. 
I think it's only polarizing if you try to erase history. There's this massive, I think, like idea of wanting to go back to the glory days. The glory days were built on colonization. They were built on racism. They were built on sexism. They were built on homophobia. They were built on transphobia. If that's what you want to go back to, if that's where you think you have space, we are all being fed this lie of like, things were great in the 1950s. Things weren't great in the 1950s unless you were a middle class white family but I would not be friends with a white person who doesn't understand white privilege and doesn't understand racism. Do you get stopped and searched by police? Do you get called a Paki sag on the way home? No, you don't. You hold white privilege. So like the thing about racism, it's not just prejudice, it's also institutionalized racism. Are you less likely to get a job because your name looks different, sounds foreign, right? It doesn't, you don't have to compare oppression. Like I'm very middle class, so I don't face the same oppression that working class people do. That's not to take away from the racism that I face or the sexism I face. I don't have a single view on statues. I've been writing about multiple statue controversies. And what I'm interested in in each of those situations is what's at stake, right? We're arguing about a statue, but uh, to some degree, that argument is also about something else. And I'm interested in that something else. I'm also interested in statue because ultimately that something else will tell us what to do with, about, to, around the statue. So to think about Gandhi in Ghana, for example, uh, the statue was put there in 2016. These new Gandhi statues are symbols of a rising India. The Ghanaian protesters said Gandhi was a racist and casteist, and they were also referencing increasing incidents of racism against African students in India and also talking about the increasingly imperial presence in India in sub-Saharan Africa. More recently, at least one of those protesters had said, we would be happy if we had a statue of Ambedkar, because he is somebody whose ideas we share. So I do not see the protest as the nativist protest. In some way, the roads must fall, the case is clearer, simpler. With Gandhi, there is, there is something to be redeemed and salvaged, and that people have done, including Black African leaders, because we very much respect and look up to. With the roads, I struggle to see what can be redeemed and salvaged. The roads must fall uh, movement is one that I do have reservations about. Cecil Rose, he was a racist, but he is part of history. I don't think the spirit of the the colonization of curriculum requires us to deal with history in a revisionist way like that. Let history judge the man for what he actually did. The, the, the statues should be left. They were built and put up there in a celebratory way. With the change of time, the same monument can be a monument of shame. I think just as important as it is to have these physical kind of shows of bringing down statues, it's also more important to just make people understand because a lot of British people will not understand why you're doing that. And sometimes it can seem a bit upfront to be doing those things, it can seem a bit violent. But I think first explain or kind of popularize the idea that history does have to be revised, explain why you should not see Churchill as this black and white amazing figures, that there's a lot more nuance to it. I think sometimes to help people understand through a bit more gentler, because if you are white and you like if you come from an English heritage, you never really look beyond your own privilege. That doesn't make you racist, that doesn't make you ignorant. But if you're gonna shout and use physical violence, this also stops people from understanding. Sometimes there are questions about who it will be returned to. So when the, whenever the issue of the coin door, for example, is brought up, the diamond, this is passed through so many different hands, Persia, Iran, India, different kingdoms, that the idea of an original owner is, is very difficult to pin down. There are other contexts where the artifact does have a clear provenance from somewhere. It means something to a particular community. The Elgin Mobiles is an interesting case. The British Museum, I think, has said that by displaying these objects and artifacts in a British museum, it has effectively opened it up to the world to come and see. I don't buy that argument because to get inside Britain is not an opportunity that is open to everyone. 
about artifacts having to go back and the apology. And I'm not sure why, I'm not sure about it. <laughs> so I need to think it through. Uh, the question of reparations, I think is an important one. I think the idea of apologizing or rec I don't know if you need to apologize. I think it's more a recognition of the past and that that past was one of hierarchy and domination as political power. So rather than venerate someone like Churchill, portray him for what he was. He might have been a great leader with regard to the war here, but actually his um, a an oppressive despot elsewhere and provoked great misery in India and elsewhere in the empire. I wouldn't want to study anywhere else. I guess it's sort of um, the vibe that something's happening, like like people are engaged in political issues. Um, but of course, these are all the things that so sells itself with. There's a lot of marketization around that image. So I think the universe is also um, sort of herald, is that the right word, for decolonizing philosophy. But, but I've, I've experienced that all, those, all the lecturers here are white in terms of representation. People often use decolonizing as a buzzword now and then in the, in the lecture, but, but the actual structural thinking behind what they're saying didn't change. This year I found that a few professors are arguing from a more guilty perspective, like, oh, you know, oh, I'm white, but um, I'm still trying, sort of. Um, but I think that at the end, the university, because of its colonial foundation, specifically this university, cannot be decolonized. I think if something so foundational, colonial, to decolonize it would only mean to tear it down, I think. When I did apply to SOAS, I was asking a bit some questions to English people, and I remember one mentioning they are famous now because there has been problems with the militant students. I think last year, or maybe the year before, SOAS was in the newspapers a lot. And I thought, okay, interesting, uh, because what I dislike quite much in Belgium is that you have a lot of students that are passive. They go to classes, they pass the exams, and they go back home and play PlayStation. We will need to look like crazy people, like we just, just want to throw all the white people off the curriculum. It's really simplified. I prefer young students which have a dream, somehow militant, than just passive students, because it forces yourself to open your mind. If people read that and think that that's what SOAS is, and we have difficulty finding work afterwards because of that, I guess that's why decolonizing needs to be a wider societal project. So when I heard about the fact that SOAS was quite uh, alternative, a uh, bit militant, I heard even radical by English people, I thought, okay, let's go there. And I hope, I hope that my uh, stay of two years at SOAS has changed me, proved me that it was possible as well to interact and build something with someone which could be, who could be completely different to you, even radical. Family relationships really come into dialogue, so not all dialogues, just, you know, kind of mutual sharing of ideas. There are a lot of silences, silencing practices, voicelessness, people feeling like they don't have even the language in which to join into the conversation. But forcing people to speak is equally problematic. Their silence can be a way of you having to reorient yourself to what the purpose of that dialogue is. And you know, a refusal of dialogue is equally an important and appropriate thing. In my opinion, even if it's not attacking for me, I realize even when I speak on such things to other white, my white counterparts, I come across as threatening or, or, or radical. It's a bit too much, or I'm too hard, I'm too harsh. So really, I just don't speak on things. At the same time as well, I feel like I don't really care. It's not my time, it's not my place. I don't have to waste my energy on telling you. If your moral compass is somewhere else, then that's on you. But I, I, I'm more concerned about getting my own degree and changing my own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But then I also think, what about people that come to SOAS that are not necessarily your typical SOAS student? Yeah. Um, just because they don't have those kind of views, does that mean that they shouldn't be heard either? No, 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 it isn't. 
not ignorant. I'm not saying if they're probably no, no. if they're like of a more conservative, or not the party, but just generally conservative nature. If you're white and you're conservative, coming to study Africa, then what is your real purpose? Speaking as an African person. If they see something problematic, but what if they don't see something problematic? There is no actual African department. You know? They got rid of that. <laughs> it's called School of Oriental African Studies, but we don't have a department. My God, what's going on? Not many black readers or like uh, black scholars or black lecturers. The philosopher Jacques Derrida wrote a book called Monolingualism of the Other. He was a French Algerian Jew. And in this book, there's this refrain says, I have only one language, but it is not my own. And I think that that really kind of sums up where we are with decolonization. Uh, in whose language is this happening? If you want to know about freedom, then I don't think that some bourgeois chap sitting in his posh office. 19th century is the place to learn about it. I think that learning from a person who's been enslaved, they're going to tell you what freedom is. So often the most shy students don't say anything. So do we have a teaching practice that is inclusive enough? And often those students who don't say anything, they come from abroad or their family come from abroad or English is not their first language. How do you bring them in? And how do you make them comfortable enough, strong enough to share their knowledge and perspective of the world? There are voices that are usually very often not heard and there is something interesting coming from them. So, so let's talk. It's the first year that so was uh, open to the public to recruit uh, people from China. So for me, this program is very really fabulous. I related my own struggles to the need to decolonize and the kind of paucity, can I say that, of the debates there was no debate around decolonizing at my university. We were taught canonical texts in classical way. It was only when I got to my critical theory class that we were reading against the grain and I realized that this was something that I'd always done. I, I've always been critical, always ask questions. Uh, at the very beginning, I feel a bit shocked. I feel, wow, the students are so brave to say, to speak it out. I was, I was the original thought. Um, but Lara, I feel that I should really support them. And the times where I am silent, usually, I, it's not because I lack the knowledge, it's because I'm trying to neutralise what I'm saying. I'm trying to negate what I'm saying, which is a difficult thing to spot. Because, you know, as a kind of like Chinese international student, especially Chinese student here, the research methodology or research um, habits that we used to in China is quite different from here. To read a literature text for, for how it is, the way it is, and just talk about it as if the author doesn't matter, and to talk about it as if we as readers, our um, political beliefs and where we come from doesn't matter, it, you're like romanticizing it, deferring to it, George Eliot is this, George Eliot is that, but what about George Eliot in relation to empire? Like, that was never taught. My supervisor would always say, okay, you're not always explaining things enough to us, and you also miss some important points. But actually, if I explain in, in words and in verbal languages, having me talk, talk with them, my thoughts, they say, oh, that's okay, but why didn't you write it down? You know, by the point, I, I think I'd normalised so much trauma, like from home to St Andrews to, you know, so much violence from violence in the institutions in terms of the education that you're paying for is actually like punishment for yourself in a way. But I think that if it is in Chinese, I mean, if I was in Chinese kind of world, you should write something which is perfectly informal it's time to explain, explain everything in the full detail. I got really good grades in, in, in my undergraduate study in beauty in China. But now, w when I was at SOAS for my MA, in, in some subjects, I was not really, really well. Even I worked really hard, but I couldn't find the right way to do it. The world is just technically, and sometimes Western dominating, like I mean, they're quite brave to say, speak it loud, like we are, we are the ones to class minds to like, like Western style. 
it's education to get a job at the end of the day is education to be more developed as an individual at the end of the day but is it education for you because when 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 i was there i say okay maybe it's my fault i should cast minds to to what my lecturer says about so i worked really hard to 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 change language actually change a lot i change a lot I was born, yeah, in the 90s, went to primary school in Leeds, went to high school there, and I applied to and I got into history. It's like a form of neglect, I'd say. You go through school and you never learn about why you ended up there. And the reason why you aren't in Pakistan is because of this historical context. What's weird is that you connect within children this double consciousness where they're like, yeah, you know, like, I really like history and it's really cool, but also like, on some level, knowing that you're not, you're not a subject of history, history, you don't know what your history is, you're completely displaced from it. And I think that becomes even more difficult and confusing when you're in this context of racism, and particularly with Brexit now of exclusion from Britishness. I work with kids in schools who are like 11 years old and they know fully, they know how racism affects them. And yet if they're 11 and they are that, to make the argument that it's too complex or too complicated to teach them about empire and slavery and being part of it, it's not too complex one intellectual integrity and two i think it's what's owed to them it says to them we actually value you as individual human beings when you give people history you're actually giving them political value the world has been constructed because you've been in it people like you we had like this week in year eight where it was like slavery week or something like and we had to like sing like these songs in music we were singing like like this you know there's a slave song like ho emma ho you dig you dig around turn around dig a hole in the ground and now i'm just like that's so weird when they were talking about dutch colonials they made it out to seem out like it wasn't that bad at all they just spoke about they're like slavery happened it was bad it was bad <laughs> They got their freedom. Everything's good. They're living their lives. No. Free. <laughs> Equal. They like some hard patches, but then after that, you know, everyone is living their best lives. Like the end of Hairspray, the music. <laughs> like, literally. It was uh, American chattel slavery in America. They didn't teach us anything about Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, or British colonies, anything about Africa. Even GCSE, I remember the fact that they pitted um, Malcolm X against MLK. Mm. Out of it. And also, they love to ignore women in black history. Apart from Rosa Parks. Yeah, let's hear about Rosa Parks. I never heard anything about Angela Davis. I love Rosa Parks, okay. Rosa Parks, yeah, but in my, in my opinion, Angela Davis is much more effective, much more powerful. I don't think they even told me about Harriet Tubman. No, no. me neither. Wow. It's just very, no pun intended, black and white race becomes this american phenomenon even to say to children hey did you know that the civil rights movement in the uk too i don't even know about the bristol bus quaker until last year i didn't know there was a british back panther equivalent until literally someone was doing a phd about it and told me i remember doing geography at high school um my teacher saying something about them um, britain um gave a uh, democracy and railways to india and that and that is how colonial is narrated as a gift as giving and that is how it was narrated at the time and i was like what's changed then I mean, Meanwhile, one of my friends read a primary school textbook about Native Americans, and it was and it was literally um, Columbus went around the world in his travel. It was literally he made friends and he gave them some drinks and they gave him some gold, and it was all very like chummy chummy. If you say to them racism was um, really inherent in the empire, they're like, oh, okay, they don't think that's a moral judgment. Whereas if you say that to imagining staff, I'm not a racist, and kids are ahead of school in that sense. I think that's because they, you know, they have Instagram, Tumblr. Twitter, they're able to access debates to, to that we're only just beginning to see as valid. I think schools have structural issues. I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, my school, kids go to school in North London and all the teachers are white and all the TAs are people of colour. I don't think they do it deliberately on purpose. It's a structural unconscious bias. I got a bit concerned about my children and I went to the school, so how do you teach? I suppose it's, you know, they probably thought I was ridiculous, a parent coming in, how do you talk about multiculturalism at this age? 
But, you know, I have mixed race kids and my kid is saying to me, I'm white. I mean, it's good as a dinner table conversation. It makes me confront race on my own home ground. But it also makes me concerned that my kid wants to attach herself to whiteness more than anything else. I mean, I don't know much about the secondary school system, but the primary school system, certainly I found that quite an eye opener. And, and it's patriarchal. Women make cakes and men make financial decisions. I have a slight degree of skepticism regarding how much we can think about decoloniality as an emancipatory politics. Somewhere, yes. Other places, no. Uh, and in a paradoxical situation, if you think of decoloniality as indicating the impossibility of universal values, then in the Indian case, think about the fact that Dalit populations, tribal populations, very poor farmers, very poor workers, they're the ones who sometimes march under the flag of the Communist Party. They're the ones who will often ask for UN protection. They might ask for recognition under UN charters for human rights and the like. Uh, likewise, for people who are migrants or refugees, now decoloniality would think of humanitarianism and anything which is universal as necessarily an imposition of the West. So I would be in favor primarily of rethinking the curriculum in which we don't abandon universalism. What we abandon is the idea that the West becomes universal. It's still an academia, this incredible sense of individualism and ownership of a thesis and of knowledge and for me so I'm a twin for example for me the biggest violence is this individualism I really struggle with it I have never been one person I've never been an I never our identity is so intertwined that I've never been able to claim ownership over myself, which I wouldn't even want to anyway. And this where the colonial theory comes in and actually brings that part. And it gets weird, but it's just how I feel and how I think everyone actually feels. This capitalist, individual, colonial way of thinking just really makes us just be one person rather than being connected to everyone else. Now, uh, these people all love them bad. Um, I would not like to uh, say uh, that SOAS was horrible in uh, 1815, because I don't know. So your question was, what would I say if there was a critique of lack of patriotism in my critique of empire? Uh, but the whole colonization thing, I think it's very important to never uh, forget that it happened. But we should, I think, avoid to get too much frustrated about it. And I would say, I think it's even more patriotic to really confront empire and to really confront the horrors of the past. No, we should look towards the future. Because there's so many people who now count as British, who have suffered from the horrors of the past. So it's only respectful. At SOAS, this comfortable thing of lecturers being here longer than we've been alive, so they're part of the furniture. That means that they can do whatever they like, say whatever they like. So, yeah, if you want to talk about patriotism and love of country, then you have to acknowledge your past. Otherwise, um, it's just a joke. And there's been multiple cases, one of which I've experienced myself, of lecturers doing things like saying the N-word. And I think that in 2018, we still have actually some aspects of colonization, but we must, as new generation, build something together. The rebuttal is always, you know, it's from the book. And that's where I feel that whiteness is also valid, because that world is still very much used to antagonize, to dehumanize. We must interrogate ourselves and see ourselves as more that's than has been written about ourselves and more than what's been portrayed on television, in books and in television on a daily basis. They're individuals and we are parts of groups. And I feel like there's a restriction of women of color and black women having to watch how loud they speak. Sometimes it feels liberating to be myself and to speak as loudly as I like to without saying, oh, I think she's ghetto, I think she's this, I think she's that, just to be myself and to understand that these pejorative and derogatory neighbors that are attached to us, like ghetto and aggressive, spicy, sassy, that, you know what? 
they are labels that have been thrust upon us and they're not true i'm an individual so if i'm loud that is because i am loud not because everyone who looks like me is loud i'm friends with a lot of older people here as well as being a slightly older student myself my colleagues are 22 21 i was jaded before they were you know they're middle class they're some of them are you know and it's it's a different set of experiences we don't help ourselves because we use messages of unity, students must stand together, we're a union, but there's all this erasure here of kind of people's differences, you know, d different is dangerous. At least if you're searching, you know that you're lost. I don't feel that some people know that they're lost. I mean, history is a troubling thing. I mean, history doesn't completely allow us to say we were also glorious ones. We should be teaching how to deal with traumatic histories, which is the histories of the colonized world, but also the histories of the suppressed peoples of the colonial, of the colonizing world. You know, the women and the working classes, Marx writes about that. He documents that there are vagrancy laws. If you're out and about on the streets, from the village to the city, you're caught the first time, you are whipped. Second time around, you have amputations. You can be executed for walking around without any walk. You look at King Leopold in uh, Congo, and you look at the amp amputations, and you look at the brutal beatings of people who were considered to be not working to their full potential. We already had a template of that within the European scenario. Now, one could write a different kind of European history, which says your history was not as glorious as you've made it out to be, and take those bits of the traumatic history of the suppressed people of Europe and see how that works out in relation to the traumatic history of the colonized people outside of Europe. For me, that would be a fruitful thing to do in such a way that decoloniality comes into Europe. I don't think there is such a thing as original sin in terms of educational establishments. The fact that like, we were so much involved in understanding the rest of the world, even though from the beginning, through some kind of tinted glasses, means that what we have to do is to make sure there is no tinted glasses being left, to make sure that you tinted glasses don't come back. In one's capacity as a teacher, as someone researching um, often quite vulnerable and marginalized communities, there is a danger that one could exercise power in ways that perpetuate or perpetuate a kind of colonial relationship. I think that all of us have the capacity to be both oppressed and oppressor. So I think the decolonizing agenda has to be both about struggle against the external world, but also about a sort of self-reflection. In one's capacity as a teacher, as someone researching, um, often quite vulnerable and marginalized. Like Sanskrit, 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 at Oxford. I went off to India on a gap year. Hello, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the film. It was great seeing it again. Uh, we're going to go straight into our panel discussion and I'm going to invite our panelists one by one to share some thoughts. Uh, the first person I'd love to call is the theater maker Jawad Alipur. Uh, you must have heard about his play, The Believers Are But Brothers. You're gonna get a chance to see it again because it's going to be on at the home in Manchester and the story is about the radicalization of young men through social media. Uh, he says he makes political theater that gets you in your guts and in your heart. Thank you so much for being part of this panel, Jawad. Thank you. May I invite you to say a few words? Thank you, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, uh, my, as, as uh, someone was saying, my name is Jawad Alipur um, and I'm a theater maker and filmmaker based in Manchester from 
where I am from which sort of tier three location I am currently calling in. So um, obviously the first thing to say is how, how much I enjoyed the film and um, like it's a huge congratulations to you guys for sort of making it. And, you know, as um, you know, uh, so just seeing the company, I thought, I thought there's some, some amazing like chameleon like uh, response in the moment to how people were changing to different voices and stuff. I think one of the things, some of the things that I was thinking of when I was watching that were, were really like, you know, these conversations are conversations that are live, I think, in all kinds of spaces. So, um, you know, uh, we have um, this question of like decolonization and the question of like diversity and representation, obviously hugely live questions in the arts world and the broadcast world and all that kind of stuff as well. And I think, I suppose, there's a couple of things I think about when I when I when I sort of um, see the myriad that kind of like a uh, sort of chorus of voices, if you like, um, talking that different ways. It's, it's interesting to me how I think I think that um, I sort of um, uh, you know uh, for my sins I've got you know got a bit of an interest in like um, uh, sort of psychoanalysis and stuff. And I think you see that in some of my my work. And I'm, I, when I hear that word used, I'm sort of reminder of that old fashioned idea of like a sort of master signifier being at work to the extent that I think uh, the idea of decolonization is something that obviously carries so much emotion for so many people, you know, like we see it on the conservative side as well as it, uh, the, is it a Jew, I can't remember name, ba ba the, not the junior culture minister or education minister or something like this was saying, you know, our, our curriculum doesn't need to be decolonized because it hasn't been colonized and so on. And so on, if you like, on the bad guys side, they're as emotional about it as, you know, they are on the other side. But I think what's interesting is how much of a, of a, of a kind of contested meaning it is and how much perhaps actually the deeper work that needs to happen is about what exactly people are calling for when they're calling for that, which is reflected in the, obviously the piece of work we just watched on the one hand. And on the other hand, mm, exactly what the demands are that are being made. So... I don't know. I, I my work tends to be. I made a, one of my recent shows is called Rich Kids: uh, A History of Shopping Malls in Tehran, and um, that I should do a little bit of a plug. You can see like <laughs> online broadcasts of and a number of theatres over the forthcoming months, um, and that's that. That reflects you know I've got heritage in the Middle East. Do you know what I mean? And I, I just sort of think about like one of the challenges for me is when I sort of think about this thing and I think about like uh, thinking about colonial history and then decolonial history and. I, you know, uh, as someone with kind of like broadly speaking Muslim Middle Eastern heritage, I see the situation in Syria, you know, the, the grotesque, grotesque abuses there. And I, I see the behavior of the Iranian regime, uh, both internally and in Syria. And I think, you know, kind of uh, one of the realities we need to think through about that is that these kind of post colonial or anti imperialist regimes are. Uh, you know, have an ability to kind of um, uh, brutalize those populations in a shape set up for them by those older powers, for sure, for sure, historically, but have an ability to stack up the bodies in a way that would make any kind of like French or British colonial empire blush, to be honest with you. And I sort of think, I sometimes think that, um, you know, this, this question of one of the one of the things that really, really inspired me on that on, on that film was when, uh, you know, there was, a, there was one of the characters said there how Actually, there's a question about um, uh, internationalizing beyond the West, not assuming that what goes for the West goes for everyone else. And this is something that I, that I think about a lot in my work and try and you know address. I'm, I find um, that uh, you know there's a, 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 a the, the title of Chatterjee's book, um, Politics in Most of the World. I find that like a really nice provocation that I often make in outside of it. I'm not an academic uh, outside of, in my context. I often make in the kind of arts and culture context. When I say to people, I think, you know, even for a lot of people of color, even for a lot of minority people and so on, when we grow up in the West, we still have in our bones, like a lot of the white left do, the white progressive movement, a sort of feeling of the West and the rest that we really need to, to get, get, get past, you know? So, so one of the things for me, uh, when I think about what does it mean to make work which which isn't kind of uh, Eurocentric or, 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 or tries not to be, or tries to stand against being bound up with that history, is to sort of deal with that reality about um, uh, deal with that reality about what like that Western Europe isn't most of the world, so to speak, that Western Europe, as the old slogan used to go, you know, the idea of provincializing Europe, do you know what I mean? It's but one corner sort of thing. 
And I think that's something that, that I'm I'm really keen on. And I, and I wonder, I sometimes think, I, said, I know I've been talking a little while, but I, I, I suppose the last little thing that it makes me think of that I'd leave you with, which I think is linked to that, is that I think when I, th when I think about, when I think about our little corner of the world, you know, Western Europe, the US and so on, I think one of the challenges is that it's, and this is an obvious thing to say, is that it seems that largely we live in a, uh, uh, you know, we live in this very, very divisive moment where uh, there's quite, kind of a hard distinction between how people are thinking about these questions. I sometimes jokingly put it like this. I say, you know, at the minute in England, there's two kinds of people, basically. There's like half and half, or one, one kind of, let's be clear, two kinds of white people. One, one kind of white person who, if you say, I think this thing that you did is a bit racist, their response would be, oh my God, really? Okay, let's think about that and actually move together forwards. This way. And the other half, if you go, I think that thing you did is racist, they'd go, how dare you call me racist? We fought a what, blah, 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 blah. And I wonder, I think if we get this question right about um, really thinking about how we can articulate uh, the notion of the bit of the world we are in as, as, as just one part of it, that's something that can kind of cut across that divide. So those are some slightly circuitous remarks, but I hope they're sort of, um, you know, uh, useful for the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Javad. Uh, can I now invite uh, Kwame Botang to make his contribution? Uh, Kwame is a student. He's studying anthropology at SOAS, which is fantastic. We never knew that beforehand, but it's great. And you're very passionate about advocating for teaching black history to younger people, as well as people in the university level. Welcome Kwame. Thank you, Suman. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for, for the wonderful um, documentary and performance that took place, because it, it really got the cogs turning and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, a couple of things that I was, that I was reflecting on whilst watching it, um, one was how there's so much diversity in the discussion of decolonization. And I mean that um, both eth ethnically and also um, to, to varying degrees, such as class as well. So I was wondering whether uh, the accents were a reflection of uh, people's accents, whether that was intentional, but the varying degrees to which uh, people are beginning to unpack decolonization and the points from which they come from, if that makes sense. Um, so I really loved it and I think that it it brought forth the complexities and, and the ongoing dialogues that take place. And um, again, in, in my work, uh, I try to kind of reflect that as well, um, mainly advocating for Black British history to be taught from key stages uh, one to four, and then later on into the university level as well. And really that was that was with um, the Black curriculum and that's that, that focuses on the point that, uh, excuse me, that focuses on the point that um, when we when we talk around black history and the representation of black individuals, we largely focus on on slavery and on suffrage, um, and it's always very negative. And uh, when you, it's it's a very traumatic experience to be learning that in school. Myself, when I was in school, it was a very traumatic experience for myself. And so to contribute to these um, these narratives with uh, more uplifting stories, and that's why we um we go back into history and and try and look at the the history of migration in the United Kingdom. Um, and for me, that's a that's a reflection of my myself and my ongoing um, battle with, I, I guess, positioning myself in relation to Britishness uh, and Ghanaianness as well. Um, I, I grew up in in the West Midlands in, in in Shrewsbury, so not too far from Manchester, about an hour away, um, in a small rural town. And um, so I was always quite far away from um, maybe the, you could say like uh, London or Manchester. For myself, it was London as a, as kind of a cultural export of uh, of blackness so to speak. And um, it always got me reflecting on kind of the hybridity of, of identity and how you can have one foot somewhere and, um, and one foot somewhere else. And so for me, the, the intersections of identity and how we, uh, the, and meaning and what we attribute to certain history, certain narratives um, has always been something that I've, I, I've reflected on a lot in the construction of my own identity, how I've reflected. Um, and it's something that I tried to bring into my practices as well, um, whether that be my studies or or working. But yeah, just to wrap up, I'd, I'd just say thank you very much for for the video and everything, and and it was an amazing job from everyone. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Kwame. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Gemma Desai now to share a few words. Uh, Gemma is a film programmer who's worked a lot in cultural institutions. And over the last year or so, she's taken some time off to do her own research and reflection around the, how the cultural policies of uh, institutions which are supposed to help people, what the human cost of those policies are. I'd like her to tell us a little bit more about her work, which is this work isn't for us and what do we want from each other when we have told our stories. Uh, thank you for being here, Gemma, and please say something about your work. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this film and this invitation and just echoing what um, Kwame and Javad have already said and um, thank you Kwame for like that sort of basis as well that like really personal articulation of like that interest um, in this subject and I think that like lies underneath like my comments as well and um, there's so much in this work and I, it's really hard to distill my thoughts into five minutes but I'm gonna try. Um, I think what I was really struck by was the ways that a term like decolonization can come, become institutionalized and then robbed of its like truly liberatory power. And I'm also really interested in how that then disembodies the demands of decolonization. So how it depoliticizes it and can make us the descendants of those colonized kind of um, complicit in a kind of institutional ongoing colonialism or co colonial administration, which is kind of what I think of a lot of my work in institutions has been that. Um, I'm thinking about the parallels with the work that I've done around diversity policy and cultural institutions, um, where in the process of which I was really struck by the fact that I'd never really questioned or fully comprehended until I came out of those places, that diversity policy, which I had been the beneficiary of, um, had actually subjugated me and made me complicit in my own and other people's marginalization. Um, I'd never really considered how its logic scrutinized my shortcomings um, and the others and those of others who were excluded, but never the shortcomings of those who were responsible for doing that excluding. Um, and the reason for this, like as I studied further and further was clearly structural racism, but it was always justified as this like kind of practical response related to the kind of data that could be gathered for funding. So quantitative data, my presence was really easy to communicate and qualitative data like my story or my experience was less so. And I think that mirrors a little the threads in the film around how studying these histories in an academic setting tends to privilege debate and objectivity and arguments and historical facts. So decolonization in the university might acknowledge theoretically that history is like written by the oppressor, therefore it can't include a real interrogation of the behaviors of those that oppress. But beyond that acknowledgement, the structures of the university can't seem to change enough to accommodate the resulting logic that there is a space that cannot be studied because it's missing. So a decolonized curriculum can't be read and analyzed. It has to be listened to, dreamt, imagined into existence as like a creative act and an act of subjectivity, which relates to the parts in the piece from students, which I so deeply related to about the discrepancies in experience um, being so often rooted in why we want to learn about these histories and why we have to enter these settings to do that learning. So for some of us whose parents worked all the time and didn't have time to teach us and pass down or only had access to a kind of certain colonized education themselves, we're really like looking for ourselves in these studies, we're looking for shelter in these studies and we're looking for the movement in the term pedagogy, the actual journey of it. But I was really thinking as I was listening to these testimonies, can that reality be accommodated in a setting like SOAS? Um, the bit of history about SOAS that we are told in one of the testimonies, which I wasn't aware of about how SOAS was for civil servants to learn about others was super interesting to me as well as, as someone who's worked at the British Council as a civil servant. 
um, as was the stuff um, around the way the acronym is used as a word to kind of obscure as well as like retain this colonial history. And I think that makes me really wonder about what decolonization can really be in a setting like this. Um, we, as a descendants of the colonized, can enter and take an embodied decolonial approach. But why are we doing that and who are we doing it for? Like in the same way as, you know, I explored in this work isn't for us, is this work for us? Um, if the setting was never designed to accommodate us, but to other, other us and to study us and ultimately to dominate us. Um, it made me think a lot about the current conversation about abolition and transformative justice and how we can use like a abolitionist or transformative justice logic to the work we do in different contexts and the ways we move in the world. And as that kind of conversation permeates, the language of transformative justice starts being used like more and more. And we hear people talk about accountability and harm and repair, all of which I take to be embodied decolonial demands, um, the kind of decolonial demands of the street that led to Colston being put in the river. Um, but these terms can't be used and disconnected from like the central material demands. That's a lot what Javad was also saying, the central logic of why they exist, whether it's about the abolition of the police and the harmful institutions or true redistribution of power in all its forms, as in what I understand to be the demand of decolonization. So, Finally, I'm just really interested in how these debates when theorized in an institutional setting can disconnect the material demand from like the logic or the theory. And I think that comes out in a really complex way towards the end from the speaker who talks about decolonization, not being liberatory for all, by invoking and speaking for those that are most marginalized in India. So when she talks about Dalit communities and communism and their need for the UN, I found that testimony really striking and I'm kind of getting my head around it, but it felt like an articulation of a kind of institutionalized revolution that replicates um, a kind of colonial logic of extraction. So like supposedly invoking the needs of those that are most impacted, but ultimately for the benefit of those who are least impacted. So how we all can invoke in the name of logic and rigor the contradictions lived by the most marginal to justify incremental progress or reform instead of dismantling and abolition and yet be completely and unapologetically cut off from the messiness of trying to survive and have your voices heard on a day-to-day -day basis in a world that hasn't decolonized yet. Okay, thank you Gemma. Thank you so much for sharing some very deep, deep thoughts. Um, I'd like to now turn to Dr. Miriam Francois. Dr. Francois is a researcher and a broadcaster, and some of the stories that she's covered has dealt with the situation around migrants and immigrants, around Islam, around uh, conversations around being Muslim, what it means, but she is also a research associate at SOAS, and one of her projects is We Need to Talk About Whiteness. That sounds very interesting to me. I don't know whether that relates to talking to white people about their whiteness and privilege or whether it's non-white people discussing whiteness and privilege of white people. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it was a real pleasure listening to that play for the second time. Um, I really enjoyed it the first time. Uh, in real life, I got a pleasure, the, the, had the honour of actually seeing it at SOAS, um, and I think verbatim theatre has got uh, a uniquely powerful uh, means of uh, con making you connect with the content um, rather than focusing on, on any other thing that could be distracting about performance. So I thought that was brilliant. I really enjoyed the fact that uh, being a part of the SOAS decolonizing group, a lot of the conversations that we are having at SOAS <laughs> and can finally be made public um, and everyone else can see um, how complex it is to get any form of unity or agreement and um, obviously questioning whether that is um, 
a desirable in this conversation and b if it isn't uh, what um, uh, the current situation of having diverse voices with diverse visions of what decolonizing looks like uh, then translates as in terms of change um, you asked about the podcast so yes if anyone's interested the we need to talk about whiteness podcast is um, a podcast dedicated to exploring structural whiteness um, obviously we uh, I'm sure all aware race is a construct racism obviously is very real um, and what I wanted to do in the podcast was to explore the ways in which um, people understand whiteness what does whiteness mean a lot of what we inherit around the language around race and racism is inherited from the US there were continuities with uh, the US experience but there are also um, clear divergences and understanding the way in which British whiteness specifically mm -hmm. was formed uh, what it looks like um, and, you know, in a way, I suppose, trying to delineate it so that it can better be analysed and ultimately uh, picked apart. So um, a few points. Uh, I have to say that I really enjoyed the uh, little uh, gag about every SOAS student carrying a, a, um, a, a copy of Orientalism that they've never read. If you haven't read Orientalism, you should really start. That's kind of, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we're gonna have to go back to 101. You need to definitely read Orientalism. Um, and I also really enjoyed the idea of um, not abandoning universalism, which was something that one of the um, contributors had raised, the idea that we need to um, obviously reject the idea of Western universalism as some kind of objective universalism, but there being uh, perhaps some uh, commonalities, some sort of uh, universally, universalism that different perspectives can point us towards. Um, I, I think that one of the issues that comes up both in the conversations and throughout the play is um, the degree to which these conversations are really pitting together a traditional form, a traditional conception of knowledge, which was the, the idea rooted in, in Western methodologies of some kind of scientific methodology, which would allow us to attain objectivity in our understanding of knowledge and alternative um, um, ways of conceiving of knowledge that might be more rooted in uh, individual experiences and subjectivities and and how do we find a kind of uh, a, a meeting of those conversations in a way that they uh, don't involve a complete disregard of, of each of the other um, because ultimately I think and there were a few voices in there as well uh, throwing out one framework before we've really figured out where we're headed or what the next one looks like um, however bad the initial framework is, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm always convinced that things can get worse. Just look where we're at now uh, as a country. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned personally about the idea that we could um, just throw out where we're currently at without having a sort of clear vision uh, or at least some sort of uh, vision of where we are headed with it. Um, I also think that these conversations are understandably very emotive. Um, they are conversations that are rooted often in, um, as we heard throughout the play, people's profound personal experiences. Um, and that can lead to a lot of um, anger, a lot of uh, sadness, um, all of which are important um, voices that we need to hear as part of why this conversation is even happening. Uh, the next step is how we devise a framework. And I'm personally not convinced that anger, uh, which there is a lot of understandable anger in these conversations is a framework. Anger is a fuel, I think, um, but we need a framework. And so moving forward with the decolonizing conversation, I think we need to um, understand where emotionality has its place and trying to figure out how we can extract from those narratives what it is that can allow us to move forward with the conversation. Um, the last point I really wanted to make was about um, power and about power being central to colonization and therefore power being central to decolonization. And, and so ultimately I think where a lot of the conversations might agree and certainly uh, Gemma was touching on this is that the, the idea of this is ultimately a power, this is a project about power sharing, this is a po project about deconstructing the traditional power brokers and finding new ways to create more equal uh, societies that in which different forms of knowledge, different perspectives are equally recognized. Um, we obviously haven't figured out how those modalities might operate and I think that's where we're 
we're currently at. But I think we're obviously on the path to trying to uh, decipher how those different perspectives can come together and allow us to create new frameworks of learning, I suppose, in the context of SOAS specifically. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now I'm going to invite uh, Iqbal Khan. Iqbal is a freelance theatre director who has worked a lot with a lot of the kind of institutions that Jemama have been talking about. Uh, you've worked with the Leicester Haymarket from time, you've worked with the Bolton Octagon, the National Theatre, and lately with the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, the Macbeth, people may have heard about the Macbeth, which had Hugh Quashi as Macbeth, and maybe controversially, Lucien Masamati as the Iago, and more lately, Tartuf, set in a Pakistani household, in Birmingham. Welcome Iqbal and tell us a little bit about your thoughts around decolonizing in your own work and your comments on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. Uh, just to kind of clarify, it was Othello. <laughs> ah, I <laughs> okay, okay, that, okay. honestly, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, but but uh, yeah, just, just to echo what everyone else has said about how extraordinary I think that film is. Uh, uh, so complex and I've seen it a few times now. Um, and it's sort of, it, 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 I find it particularly compelling because it, it sort of does really elegantly what, what, what I think um, um, we're, we're, all, all of us practitioners are trying to do in terms of opening up who tells the stories and what, what stories we tell. Um, and and it, it does it, and maybe this is a factor to do with verbatim theatre, but this this is in the ear version of it is extraordinary because because what, what it does is it it sort of dislocates and relocates our presumptions about identity. Uh, we have the identity of the actor, but then we have these other tremendous uh, music experiences, uh, textures coming through bodies that I know that I'm reading them in a certain way before they start speaking and all of those things are being challenged. So um, how we read those, the, the assumptions we have about those bodies um, before we hear their testimonies are, are constantly being challenged. And I, I can't think of anything more important to be doing now. And, and, I, and I think that about myself, not just about what I think is good for the world. Uh, I carry my assumptions about people and, and, and their, their experiences and their heritages and, and that piece over and above the, the, the extraordinary testimonies, just, just the form of it is, is an incredibly important thing to do, I think, at the moment. Um, and, and this decentering of the of context is, in, is incredibly important. There, there's a, because I think at the moment in the world, it feels to me like there's a, and decolonizing the curricula is completely about this, about a contest over the center. Um, and this, this, this texturing of voices, I think, did it absolutely super, superbly well. Um, and and it, 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 it does what I, what I think, um, I hope I've tried to do in, in, in my career, which is, I mean, I, I, I like to think that I'm a radical artist. I try and be a radical artist in, in spite of the fact that I've worked with all of those institutions that you talked about, because that, that's, it's not, not easy to be ra radical when you're engaging with um, mainstream organizations that have particular kind of material economic pressures. Um, and you yourself have constantly the desire to qualify. Um, so that you can have ongoing relationships that will then allow you to challenge the this, this, this sorts of assumptions that people might have had before they gave you the job. Um, but, I, but I've always tried to sort of fight to be ra radical, but, but, but what I mean by radical is, is, is not to be uh, edgy and risky or, 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 um, or simply sh shocking, um, but to simply to, to, to challenge my a priori assumptions and biases, to, um, to, to, to try and ensure that when we're making a piece of work, that when I'm sharing a room with other people, that, that, that we're all having those foundational conversations, um, challenging our existing paradigms. And the important thing about that for, for me, and, it, and, I, and I hear it in everything that everyone said up to now, is, is, is that it, 
allows us to uh, have a conversation about those things that we value um, and to be um, to to challenge in, in particular in the in the theater industry a, a performance history that that sometimes means more than the texts that we're working with um, and, and and those are the sorts of expectations that audiences are bringing in and and so when, when we are doing the kind of work that when certain artists inflected with whatever definitions of legacy and heritage that the mainstream want to impose upon you there, there's always this this kind of um association of risk because they feel audiences are going to be nervous about what we'll do with the mainstream work um which which i, I so this it's there's always a kind of conditional access to that uh platform um and and i've i've always tried to challenge that um and just to say it in a slightly different way um the sense I have is 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 that um, the gatekeepers generally tend to welcome formal innovations and unusual stories. That's how they define the 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 um, participation, the contribution um, of people who who aren't normally working in those in, in those haven't worked in those environments, as opposed to. Uh, a kind of an innovative or unusual perspective, because I don't think that I, uh, I mean, I I fell in love with kind of traditional British theatre uh, British theatre history. I've lived here. I, I I I have an engagement with world literature and and world film and, but actually, so much of what makes me uh, what has what has formed me is Western uh, performance history. But what I do have, because of everything else that makes me what I am, is is um, is a is a, a a complex perspective on these things, um, and that often isn't engaged with what we're what we're asked to do. Uh, what 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 we know the expectation is is that we we come in and, and we fragrance our work. In some un unusual way, and 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 that's always th that's the reason why, as it were, the theatre literate audience will come and see our uh, you know uh, experimentation with 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 their work, and it's it's changing, decentering, decolonizing those expectations, um, recentering those conversations. That it feels to me is, is is so important from my perspective, but also in terms of the perspectives of of those in education and. And in many many other other spheres, is 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 um, basically challenging the inherited perspectives that we have. Um, I mean, truth is a slippery thing. I mean, I'm not I'm not interested. I'm truth, objectivity versus subjectivity. It's all, it's a provisional thing, um, and I hate any kind of sense of uh, our history teaching us. Um, or contributing to ideologies, existing ideologies. I think the opposite should be the case. We should be uh, equipped to critically challenge everything that has come before us. It's the most exciting place to be, and therefore, we, we, uh, the 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 views of those that disagree with us are, are, are welcoming. We know what we think. <laughs> you know, it's 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 more interesting to be challenged. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm going to wrap up because I I know there's there's not much time and. Um, a lot of people have said a lot of very interesting things as it is, but but I think that that's what your piece did brilliantly. I think just as 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 a work of art, it I think it did all of that. I mean it. Uh, I mean I, and and also just 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 some some of the insights. I mean, learning from a person who's enslaved will teach you what freedom is. Oh my God, <laughs> it's extraordinary. And there were so many moments like like that. That that bring you up sh up short in, in in that piece, but but as I say, they're liberated from from any sense reductive sense of that person's identity uh, that, that we're imposing, and I and I think that's a profoundly important thing to be doing. Thank you very much, Iqbal. Thank you so much.
Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Christine Landon Smith, who directed the show, to make a few comments because her work in theatre, her intercultural work, has always been decolonized. I think even before we began using the term in the same way, but also to respond to a couple of points raised in the context of the accent of the actors and what Iqbal just said about uh, the presumptions of what an actor cannot do. Would you talk a bit about that, please, Christine? Yeah, I mean, thanks everyone for your very generous comments. I mean, I think the thing is this headphone work is an extension of my intercultural actor training. Um, and as Iqbal says, um, you know, the, 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 the actors are listening to the people that they are performing as they perform them. So the actors become the conduits for those people without judgment, without exaggeration, without approximation. And then I think, this is why I'm very drawn to the technique, because then I think you can, you can begin to hear the nuance and the complexity of the lived experience, which I, I mean is very difficult to, to, to hear and to, to, to see. So this headphone work is, is a natural extension of the, the actor training work that I do. And my act training work has come from, you know, when Suda and I ran Tamasha and we had a um, artist training wing called Tamasha Developing Artists, I observed that the actors of diasporic heritages, anyone who felt somatically othered from the cultural authority would come and they had on so many occasions never been really allowed to use their full self in the rehearsal room. There'd been this sort of complicit understanding that look, you know, you come in but leave maybe the Vietnamese side of you outside the door, leave your first language out, leave your family language, leave your code switching out and just come in and, and um, you know, be the standard because you know those those conservatoire trainings where I now work, um, you know, they're they're post-war. They were built up, you know, after the war, and many of them have lagged behind in um, taking in any sort of um, impact of immigration. So anyone with a sort of slightly different vernacular or a different language have not used those in those trainings. And those, I have, I've, I observe that, the, that, that these actors and indigenous, I've worked, done a lot of work in Australia, are hugely, hugely, hugely disadvantaged because they can never use their full selves. And I think it's like Gemma said, the discrepancy of experience in that space is really gaping. So the student who's, who's paying the same money is, is often really not getting an education, is sort of rather being traumatized because their 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 nuanced identity is being erased. So um, yeah, look, I guess my work has been to observe this and then to do a very deep study around um, what this means, what it has meant, what has been the impact of this, um, what have been the studies around it, what has been the theory, you know, who else is writing and teaching in this way, and just really to create a sort of absolutely equitable, inclusive space where every single person in the rehearsal room in this embodied practice can, um, can have the same sort of ownership and validity um, around their persona that, that anybody in the room has. And, you know, it, 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 to, 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 to teach that in, in, in an institutional space is, is, is immensely difficult. And I'm finding it immensely difficult because I think in a way, you know, a, the d d diversity, I mean, Gemma was talking about this diversity, especially in the conservatoire training space has been an HR issue. It has not been a pedagogical issue. And the minute you talk about the shifting, the real grounding of the pedagogy, I mean, it's just very, very, very challenging. And to make that intervention is, is I mean, I'm trying, <laughs> but it's, it's a long, that is a long, that's a long, you know, you're in for the long haul. Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's my practice. It's based on, it's based on, it's based on that desire. <laughs> I think I've said enough as, as, you know, we haven't got much time, so let's move on perhaps. Okay. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much, Christine, for sharing that. 
I, I did want to ask Dr. Amina Yakin. She she has been the director of this overall festival of ideas, and because she's been able to join us before now, um, people here have talked a lot about about power and whether in, in something like SOAS or in any university you can attempt to decolonize. Um, I mean, do you want to share some of your own thoughts about why you're doing this festival and and how do you feel? Do you feel optimistic about how you can challenge the institutions from within the institutions? or we have to create new knowledge systems and ways of learning. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And um, a huge thank you to all the cast, to Butcha Boulevard for, for a wonderful um, show, for doing it for a second time. Um, I, um, it, it's been, I mean, the, the question you've asked me is, is a huge one and I don't know uh, if I can, I'll attempt to answer it. Um, there have been so many <clears throat> fascinating perspectives to listen to from the world of theatre and, and generally the conversations we've been having about institutions and institutionalization when it comes to conversations around decolonizing, whether that is, um, that was one of the things we uh, talked about at this afternoon debate for and against decolonizing knowledge to, to say whether the university is a space that is possible to be um, decolonized. And, and there were some positions put forward with regards to the fact that because it's an institution, because it's part of a neoliberal capital kind of structure in, in itself, it becomes very challenging to have that um, decolonizing in in the idealistic way that we would like it to, to make education a place that is free higher education a place that gives access a place that that is meaningful to society when we are confronted by those very structures that make the institution into the ivory tower um and and I, I think your play brings that out very, very nicely um, with, with the conversations that, that happen across the students, the staff. You know, we, we do want to talk about philosophy. We do want to talk about critical thinking and we are very much encouraging research led thinking. And so the Festival of Ideas was really about connecting with that with that framework and to try and work out um, a research led conversation in the institution, which was connecting with colleagues across disciplines and not just colleagues within SOAS, but also outside with the fact that we are teaching and researching Global South uh, destinations or places and, and the Global South is not not a you know uniform place. It's, it's made up of very many places and very many histories. And how how are we doing that in our research practice? What are the ethics? And one of the questions that has come up in the fest, lots of questions have come up in the festival with regards to what are the structures of funding, even with research funding. That um, and, and that was one of the questions I battled with as I put together the festival. And as as people who work in theatre, I'm sure this is something that you work very closely with. Who do you go to for funding, and who funds you, and in how that establishes a relationship of trust between uh, your audience and yourselves and the ethics, the, mor the morality and the ethics question with regards to, to decolonizing, which is a really important one. And I think we're finding as, as we're in this moment, in this political moment, that it's becoming very, very hard. So for me, it was it's an intellectual project. It's a research project, but it's it's also a activist project about decolonizing knowledge to to really uh, get us at so as to engage with our history to the history of the colonial institution and also to think about how how do we go forward into the future in this kind of post in this pandemic um, world that we're in and in the in the political situation that we find ourselves in. There have been fascinating conversations. We've talked about issues like capital and conflict, history and trauma, um, <clears throat> heritage and repatriation, the, the kind of big, big issue of reparations. How do we how you know, how do we come to an agreement or a consensus? What does white privilege mean? What does um, it, it does that divide society rather than bring it together? The fact that racial politics is racial divisions are at the heart of what we're 
doing? Are we are we sort of re igniting them? In what ways are we breaking those structures down in the institution? And uh, I mean, you've seen what's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the murder of George Floyd, and also with regards to what is being said about how education in schools is going to be mediated by the current um, <clears throat> um, minister. And it, it's just been, you know, we're in a funny, funny place where we have to really have these types of things, but they have to also be beyond just institutional um, benchmarks that tick the box with regards to Yes, we have a decolonizing um, presence in the institution, in the university. If we have a decolonizing group or we have a decolonizing body, what does it mean? What is it going to achieve? What kind of grassroots connections are we making? So, so that thing about disagreements, you know, we're just at the moment, we're in, in public intellectual engagement, research engagement, it is about learning to disagree, but it's learning to disagree on the basis of knowledge, on the basis of knowledge that is coming from different places, from different sources, and, and the fact, and being aware of what those sources are, what those places are, that it's not always straightforward, that there are hierarchies embedded in, in everything that we partake of. And, and therefore, you can't just write it off. You know, you can't write off the knowledge. But, but the fact that, uh, that it can be said right now, I, I mean, I really liked what I, I think um, Iqbal picked up on from leaving from a place enslaved will teach you what it is to be enslaved. And I think uh, we are really struggling with that narrative. And, and that's really my, um, my passion for, for doing this particular festival was to ignite that debate, to have the space where we could have these conversations and, and for uh, hopefully to continue forward in, in sort of future years to bring, and, and in a funny kind of way, the, the pandemic allowed us, you know, it was going to be something that was gonna happen in the university, in the space of our, um, inst in our institutional space, in May um, in a building and now it's happening across um, this internet world this global world and it's been it's been pretty amazing because we've been able to have those connections that we wouldn't have been able to have to be in conversation with with our partners be they in um, uh, South Africa or be they in um, India or Pakistan you know I, I'm just absolutely amazed by, by the response that we've had. But it's precisely those conversations that we need to have more of to be able to go uh, to some kind of society that we would all like to be a part of. And I think right now I feel deeply uncomfortable with the kind of society we're in. So that's just what I'd like to say. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a few questions and I would like us to take the questions. There was a question earlier on from an attendee who said that he was a devout Buddhist and uh, he felt a little uncomfortable seeing the statues of Buddha in places like museums. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on whether you find uh, statues of human beings who have become deities. Do you have a, anybody who would like to make a comment on that? Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. So shall I ask somebody a question? Shall I name a person? Or shall I just take a couple more questions and then maybe all the panel can th think about an answer. That's one of them. There's a couple more questions here. Um, to those on the panel who studied these themes, this is about decolonizing and so on. Uh, we're so, not giving up on universality, but Western is not universal. To those on the panel who studied these themes 20 years ago, which aspects of this conversations feels conceptually new? Okay. And, uh, and there is one about Decolonization as a practice and discourse is usually and always within my bubble. Do you think that the mainstream film industry, book publishing industry, both of which are instrumental in changing public white perception, is changing towards decolonizing the convention? I know it's a broad question. Good to hear your thoughts. Okay, so we've got three, three, three questions. 
uh, that that maybe all the panelists or a couple of them can try to answer. I mean, the, the first thing is, I think is really, it's a personal emotive one about whether uh, if you see statues of uh, people that you hold dear in terms of deities, how do you feel about seeing them in museums? I mean, I, I personally have the Hanuman, which is on my own dressing table, so to speak. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I, I, but I was just going to say, I, I, but I just called you Buddha, someone, sorry. I was, I was just, <laughs> just going to say that, that that question, isn't it fundamentally kind of what we're talking about? Which, which is that they're, they're here, it, it, it's Buddha in this instance, but it, here's a monument that, 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 that embodies somebody's beliefs that, that someone is is profoundly attached to um and how do we negotiate that person's ownership over that that monument about where it is in the world about how it's revered by others who might not attach to it the same degree of of reverence uh how do we negotiate the place and and the um visibility of, of these of these objects and uh, as these objects that, that encompass a set of beliefs um i mean that i think is profoundly the question that we're having i think the problem has been that that there hasn't been a challenge there hasn't been a conversation about the place of these things and about the values that these things uh um uh, represent um and i know it's a bit more difficult when it comes to sort of objects that that in which religious beliefs in here that's a slightly more complicated thing but i think the, the more general conversation is surely the conversation that we're having now and it, it's not a, it's not an easy conversation um it, it might be dominated by anger um and by passion at the moment but it's a necessary conversation i i don't think the answer is to just pull them down because then you you you, you erase the uh, the experience of those that that uh, have valued that, that that object. It's it's. I think you need to negotiate with it. That's my initial response. Dr. Francois, do you want to say something, please? Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, I agree with all of that, and I uh, just add also how objects are acquired, right? How do they come into the possession of museums is also a really important part of that question, and I'm sure very important to the people who are emotionally connected to those objects. And just to say, there is a conversation happening around that. There was um, a really important uh, exhibition put on uh, in Birmingham called um, "Decolonize the Museum." Um, that was all about sort of how could you, how could we look at some of the same objects that we already look at, but from a different perspective and how might, might those objects be exhibited in a way that was sensitive to the people who were, as we're talking about, emotionally connected to the histories of those objects. Um, so just, I just wanted to, to add the, 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 that obviously there's that. And then, oh yeah, one more point about multiple perspectives on any of these given issues right so we will have a buddhist who'll feel very strongly that this object shouldn't be uh, placed in a museum you'll also find i'm sure buddhist voices will say actually it's really important to us that these objects are um, represented in places that people don't know about our religion so they can learn more about this faith so it's like how how do ultimately the question is who has the power to decide who which objects are exhibited and how and if we completely seek to decentralize power, which I think is certainly part of the objective here, um, what is the alternative uh, location in which we situate ourselves in order to legitimately um, undertake any form of power, uh, any form of knowledge sharing, which ultimately therefore is, is a form of power sharing? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Java. Java, did you want to comment? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a couple of things. I mean, like, sort of um, slightly obliquely answering that. I mean, I think there's, or speaking to that issue, I think there's, I sometimes think about the, you know, the question of, um, uh, especially the news coming out of France, this question about like, you know, the, 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 the cartoons controversy coming back up and that, that kind of stuff. And I was thinking, there's sort of two kinds of voices which are excluded from that conversation. We obviously get the cliched discussion, which we'll, we'll have on one side, a sort of uh, muscular, um a liberalism which will tell you everything is open to being put in a museum or you know having the piss taken out of it or whatever and another side which is a kind of stereotyped other kind of liberalism that goes actually minority rights rah, rah, rah. but it just always strikes me that in the first instance there's always there's all there, like you know in this this 
in terms of those histories that are made to be silent, well, like, so for instance, that specific discussion will then silence the whole heritage of, like in Iran and Turkey of people, you know, people painting pictures of Prophet Muhammad, like an actually existing thing that happened, do you know what I mean? Um, and that gets just dropped from what is a largely white conversation, do you know what I mean? And then there's another, I think even more interesting thing that gets dropped from that, where you go, and I think sometimes this, some, some of this is to do with community of colour in this country, especially working class communities of colour in this country, feeling uh, punch drunk off the last 10, 20 years of moving like rightwards and stuff. And I'm just about old enough that I can remember what feel like now, you know, the sunlit uplands of the Blair years and like goodness gracious me and stuff like this being in the mix and feeling like, you know, a moment of like swagger and confidence for various kinds of minority communities. And I think a little bit about, um, you know, in that kind of conversation, I always, I think of um, Prince Nassim Hamid, the boxer, do you know what I mean? And I go, there was someone who was just fucking making it up with so much unimaginable swag. I've forgotten now. He used to come out to box with the call to prayer as his ringside music. Do you know what I mean? And you go, where does that just, just making it up now, do you know what I mean? Just re remaking it every generation. And thus, where does that go in this conversation? And to be honest, I, I think, there's no easy answers because that came out of a certain political movement moment where I think black people, Asian people had more confidence because we felt like we were winning in some way. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's very difficult to sort of engineer that without actually being winning, you know? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to ask Gemma. Gemma, do you think you feel brave enough to un answer whether the mainstream film industry, book publishing industry, uh, is uh, changing towards decolonizing the convention? I think of. I heard Steve McQueen talking on the BBC the other day to Mary Beard, and he seemed to argue that how difficult it had been for him to get his films on BBC One right now, the Small X anthology. Anyway, if you want to make a comment, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it just goes to the the sort of connections that I was sort of um, that, that actually the film makes not that I was making that the film makes around um, how colonialism structures all of our structures basically the logic of colonialism like um, impacts all of our structures and therefore all of our industries and so I think that then it goes back to the question of if a, if a structure like the film industry, like the literary agency um, industry was to decolonize itself, it would have to question the way that it had come to exist in the hierarchies that exist, in the ways that it uses exceptionalism, in the, in the ways that it creates stars, in the ways that it doesn't privilege uh, com, you know, communal ways of making and doing and distributing. Um, resource and power. Um, so I don't think that a film industry can decolonize, actually. I think it would have to really question its existence. And right now, and I also think that there's something about what you've just said, Javad, about like that time of fearlessness in like um, the 90s and noughties of like that actually it's a real culture of fear right now. And actually, this is probably the last actual real time that these industries are going to question themselves they it feels like there is change and in a representational sense because that's being demanded um and these industries are very good at presenting change but you know in the same way that some of the students were talking about some of the things that they learned changing but actually who they were taught by not changing and um, the ways that, you know, the kinds of students that we have coming into university as well, like changing because of um, how much it costs and um, how that feels and all of the things that have come into view during COVID. So, no, I don't think these industries are decolonizing. Um, and I think they would, would have to not exist if they truly decolonized. 
Okay, thank you. Um, just thought I'd mention that there is a next debate about decolonizing the publishing industry, which is part of this festival of ideas. But we are going to sort of wrap up. Uh, I'm sorry, it's short and so on. But I want to thank all the panelists for being part of this discussion and sharing your thoughts. If anybody would like to make a final comment, please put your hand up and you could make a final comment then. Uh, I can just make some closing remarks. Does anybody want to say anything at, at all? No, okay, that's great. Yes, uh, I just wanted to request Neela to put in the chat box um, some information about the donating to the SOAS Festival of Ideas just because it's been crowdfunding. Um, also to say if anybody was interested in knowing more about our verbatim process, we did a seminar about three weeks ago, which was at SOAS and the link is on the SOAS website as well on the South Asia Institute. I want to invite Dr. Amina Yakin to make some closing remarks and I want to thank everybody who was here watching our live Zoom performance. This is the first for us and I think it went well. The, the film itself, we were a bit worried about the fact that it would get all broken up on the screen sharing thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, with apologies for our technical issues, I'm uh, very apologetic about that. We This is a new process for us. We're all we're all learning. You guys, have, uh, your team have been fantastic. It's been it's been absolutely brilliant working with you. I know this is uh, there is so much hard work that goes into the process and the labor of theater production and performance. So a uh, heartfelt thanks to everyone and to the panelists for um, uh, thought provoking discussions. And it, it's, it's brilliant to see different generational voices coming together in this panel. I think um, I think what I, I was just noticing some questions um, that were cropping up in the chat box and uh, there were just about there's a question about who has who should be doing what or studying what at SOAS and I think what it touches on is the question of identity politics and I think that's a question that is um, that's been a part of um, of kind of um, of race relations but it really is a strategy that is now used by the state to fight off accusations of structural structural racism right so so we in using that i don't think there is much to be gained we really have to think about a new way of uh thinking and um practicing that that sort of debate of wokeness and political correctness and, and i think it's not about the fact that it's a divide between whiteness and blackness and it is the fact that those are constructs and that they have become so problematic in the way that they have been institutionalized so that is where decolonizing has to do its work and it's very important that it does and i'm, I'm not saying that identity politics don't matter because i know when you work in the performance industry in particular it's it's a huge kind of um concern um but um i think I, I'm not going to take up much more of your time because I also have to jump on to the next next event. I just want to say thank you uh, for a for bringing our conversations for for Butcher Boulevard for choosing so as to come to have this documentary production. It's really given us an insight into ourselves. And also, I think you've created something uh, very exciting and um, important with regards to the campus um, play. You have really started something new here because we, we've had Malcolm Bradbury's campus novels uh, that we've all um, been sort of looking at and thinking of what, what, what you have here and I hope you go on to do these kinds of of plays at many more institutions because it is precisely these very honest reflections of who we are what we do and how we listen across ourselves that we we get to a slight um, sense of um, change but um, thank you also for mentioning the crowdfunding campaign um, if you want the festival to come back next year that would be something we would very much appreciate and especially I, I want to give a shout out to all the creative artists who have been a part of this festival you have really made it extremely special so thank you from me from the bottom of my heart and thank you from SOAS as well thank you guys thanks Amina thank you good night